an Ocad in Wilmy de Kalura, Demlian, then Tursa, Igorum, Agasilu Edakis, and Shah, Iglash to Wurgan Small. So Tafal to Roy for Fad. Um, as a member of the Early Childhood Care and Education staff here in Mary Mackey College, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all on this the occasion as we celebrate 10 years of early childhood care and education graduates in the college. Um, we are particularly delighted this morning to have Dr. Florence Deneen with us to celebrate. Florence was the first, part, was the first course leader of the programme when it began in 2003 and when the first graduates graduated in 2007. So we're absolutely thrilled. Fall to war, Florence. The idea for this celebration was set in motion by Dr. Mary Maloney and, uh, earlier this year. And since then, we've been thinking about, we've been reflecting on the career paths that our ECC, ECCE graduates have taken. And they've taken diverse career paths. Some of them are working directly with children, and some of them are working on behalf of children. And whatever kind of capacity they work with children, it is our belief that they are making a huge difference to the lives of young children in our society today. We are also delighted today to welcome Professor Jim Deegan, head of uh, the graduate school here in Mary Mackey College. Jim was instrumental in the design and creation of the ECCE programme here in the college, so it is fitting that he is going to do the keynote address for, for us this morning. So without further delay, I'd like to invite Jim to address us this morning. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, thanks very, very much. Um, I, I've enjoyed every moment of this uh, so far. Uh, now I think I'll leave. <laughs> but, um, but given that there's a cake, uh, I think I, I, I might stay. Um, the title of, of my presentation is The Call of, of, of Children's Stories. And I'm delighted to present this on the 10th anniversary of the MICBA ECCE uh, degree program. I would like to begin by thanking Dr. Deirdre Brannock for the warm introduction and Dr. Ema Ring, Head of the Department of Reflective Pedagogy and Early Childhood Studies, and Dr. Mary Maloney for the invitation to speak here this morning. I would like to especially congratulate all faculty, staff, and students who've been on board for the voyage so far, including uh, Dr. Deneen, who, as we said, was the founding um, genius behind all of this and who is present here today. And to wish all the crew, including yourself, success uh, on the onward journey. Um, I would describe myself as a, an accidental uh, early childhood person. I, I didn't so much choose it uh, as it chose me. Um, through a simple twist of fate, I found myself on a scholarship beginning postgraduate studies in the summer of 1982. Uh, you were probably all just a star beam at that stage on the clunky sounding module, Comparative Scandinavian Educational Systems in the University of Oslo uh, in Norway. At that time, the eyes of the world uh, were fixed on the Scandinavian countries, following a number of glowing OECD reports. Then as now, the Scandinavian countries were lead countries in developing visions and versions of educational change and reform. Lots of things that would take decades to make a landing elsewhere, and indeed here in Ireland, in the world, were incubating in the Scandinavian countries. In Finland, they were putting the building blocks in place for their success in literacy, numeracy, and initial teacher education, which would later come to pass in international achievement surveys. In Denmark, they were developing their approach to autonomy and choice in curriculum design and implementation with a strong focus on substantive local interest. That's one of my kind of pet interests, that curriculum need to be local as opposed to broad-based. In Sweden, they were putting in place their commitment to social democracy and joined up thinking in relation to children's health, well-being, care, and education, which would later find expression here 
in the title of the very programme in which you are participants, the BA in Early Childhood Care and Education. And of course, their commitment to children's rights pioneered politically from Dag, Dag Hammarskjöld, who was the first UN Secretary General, to Olaf Palme, who was a real pioneering force in early childhood education in Sweden. Right through, they were architects behind the UN Charter on the Rights of the Child, which is also a central and animating theme in the programme that you have uh, here in the college. And then in Norway, they were doing what was at the deep heart's core of all of this for me. They were centering children in childhood. And I heard so much about child-centered education, but I really didn't know how to do it. And the, where the Norwegians were really doing good work was in centering uh, the child as in everything that they did. In the semester that followed, the module with the clunky title of Comparative Educational Systems materialized into lots of visits on how and in what ways to center children and childhood as a prior and anterior question to all other questions. And it was there in the classrooms off the Carl Johan Gata, which is the main street in Oslo, that I first saw things where I saw children painting upside down classrooms influenced by um, artists like Kandinsky. It was there for the first time I saw a child in a wheelchair being waltzed around by the teacher's aides. And it was there for the first time that I saw a roll of paper lined out on a table and all the kids as a community of practice of writers writing there together. And the lessons that I learned there on centering children in childhood are the ones that have endured for me. I mention all of this to draw attention to the realization that what we study not only has its origins and sources in the philosophies of iconic figures such as Piaget, Montessori, Vygotsky, Bruner, and Pestalozzi, and whom we'll hear more about later from students on your own program, but also in the personal, practical philosophies of all those working in classrooms with young children. And I know that this field is up against it politically and in terms of status and whatever have you, but I am convinced that your capacity to articulate a practical philosophy of education will win out in the end of the day. That articulation is so important in the next decade of, of this particular program. And so I see classrooms as places where teachers and children dance a dance. And success happens when teachers and children are rhapsodized by a very simple thing, speaking and listening to each other. Towards this end, I'll be focusing here today on how speaking and listening is expressed through the awesome power of children's stories. Stories by, for, with, from children. Mining that little bitty gritty space, that little time capsule, that special covenant between teachers and children is a key theme in this presentation. All this is very difficult where the time and space teachers and children have for, con uh, for conversation building is contested terrain in classrooms. Lots of big things at a strategic policy level tend to win out. And very often the small little things, the important things, the things at the deep heart's core lose out in that equation. So the challenge for you as you develop your personal practical philosophy is absolutely huge, but it's one that you've got to face. Before opening the classroom doors, if it were, into the world inside, I would like to highlight that stories are not only the preserve of those working with young children, far from it, but have also been embraced by others in a range of disciplines and diverse fields. Molecular biologists tell us the brain remembers the emotional components of an experience better than any other experience. Neuroscientists tell us that brain scans reveal how stories stimulate and engage the brain. Biblical scholars tell us about the greatest story ever told. Market researchers tell us stories take us to places we haven't considered before. Advertising executives, madmen, uh, tell us that stories tap the emotional vein. Social scientists tell us that stories, and this is really important, break down resistance 
and build confidence. I know, I know that will really resonate with friends of mine in the audience. Cultural psychologists tell us that children's stories are part of our moral imagination. And storytellers, last but not least, tell us that the truth is in the telling. All would seem to agree on the values of stories. What marks us apart as educators and teachers is that we not alone value stories, but we value the values of valuing stories. That's what sets us apart. And the challenge for all those working with young children, as I see it, lies in seizing the hidden potential of stories, not only as a rainy day kind of a thing, a pedagogical umbrella to put over things when you can't go out to play, but stories as a learning pedagogy, a naturally occurring, robust, anticipatory, plan phenomenon in the classroom of, of young children. Here I'm reminded of the words of a wonderful teacher I heard speaking about his own practical uh, personal philosophy once upon a time. And his advice was that the children's questions are the teacher's moral. And I absolutely love that, that how we work that, how what the children say to us, how we knead it and tie it and stretch it is a mark of our professionalism and our excellence as teachers. That individual who was very influential in my life also said that the key to any classroom and to igniting and sparking anything is to locate the funny bone. If you can locate the funny bone in any classroom, then you are really on to a very, very good start. And thereafter, tapping that funny bone judiciously and frequently will pay huge dividends. My approach originates uh, very much in the work of uh, Vivian Paley. Let me just tell you what she did. Nothing very highfalutin at all, but she was a naturally curious person. And basically, she started listening to the kids who were in her kinder pre-kindergarten classroom in, in a Boston suburb. And she realized that she was losing all that good stuff. Sure, she was taking the forms. Sure, she was writing the reports. Sure, she was marking the role. But she was losing the heart of it all. And so in the olden days, in the old reels of tape recorders, she just let them keep rolling. And as they were rolling, they kept on rolling, and she kept on teaching. And eventually, she got a, a grant to transcribe all of that. And out of that wonderful experience came the idea that, yeah, let's take the stories, let's analyze them simply, let's make sense of them, and then, in a, like, a tightly braided uh, formula, work them back into your curriculum planning and into your conversations um, about what you're doing. And wonderful books flowed from that. They include um, Wally Stories, a book of how children are encouraged to learn using their fantasies. There's one of these in the library, and I'd really encourage you to have a look at it. The Boy Who Would Be a Helicopter. Who doesn't want to read a book about the boy who would be a helicopter? A book about the challenges faced by teachers and children in a unique learning community. And why Teacher, my own personal favorite. A book about how simple terminology can convey unintended meanings and show a teacher's blind spot. And at a more macro level today, just think of all the politicians, the entertainers, the public figures who are making an absolute mess of how they use terminology and the insensitivities that are flowing from that. And to think that those life skills and all of that learning can happen with very, very young children. So once again, the challenge for you is absolutely huge. So Paley believed that learning lies not only in listening carefully, which isn't easy in itself, and respectfully, which is a, an absolute imperative, but to what children say, and most importantly of all, what they can become. And I think that that actually is the most important question to ask anyone in any placement context or in any initial years when they're in this profession, what do you think the children have become today? Where are they in their becomings? Okay, they can give you the facts, but where are they in that regard? And so now I'm going to move to the first of my stories. 
Oh yeah, I should have showed you that. That's the teacher's Marla. Pretty creative. Um, and the first of my stories, and you've got to listen very carefully to this, because the punchline is pretty hard to get in the beginning. So before I become too philosophical, here are three stories to listen to. These stories are drawn from the TED Talks presented by Sir Ken Robinson, um, often described as a thought leader in the area of creativity and innovation. Ken holds the record for 20 million views, notwithstanding all the stuff out there on leadership, management, strategy, and all of that. The TED Talks portfolio that has attracted the most attention is Ken's presentation called Schools Kill Creativity. So as you do your assignments and whatever, have to remember that a killer title does work. Um, so a title says a lot, the nativity play. Here we go. This is a story of three children in a nativity play, each one playing the part of the three kings. The first boy stood forward to deliver his lines. Joseph, who was obviously very busy that night, asked, who are you? And the boy replied, I am a king and I bring you gold. Thank you, king, said Joseph. The second boy stepped forward and Joseph asked, who are you? The boy replied, I am a king and I bring you mirror. Thank you, king, said Joseph. And Joseph asked the third boy as he stepped forward, who are you? And the third boy said, I am a king. Frank sends these. <laughs> so, and I, I'll come, I said it takes a little bit of time to figure that one out. <laughs> but I'll come back to Frank sends these later on. Story number two, and I absolutely love this one. I heard a great story recently, I love telling it, of a little girl who was in a drawing lesson. She was six and she was at the back drawing and the teacher said this little girl hardly ever paid attention and in this drawing lesson she did. The teacher was fascinated and she went over to her and said, what are you drawing? And the girl said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the girl said, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> so, um, the, la the next one, which, which I really like, those are what I would call found stories. They're hand-me-downs from other people, but they help me tell and connect with a third of my stories, which I call the green yucky frog monster. Frog fell off the slide. Um, I was really surprised to experience a variant of the drawing lesson and the nativity play again recently traveling on the Lewis from the, red, from, from the red cow to Abbey Street. I'm sure that's an odyssey that many of you have taken. Passing over the bridge at Houston Station, the train stalled and the view to the left was pretty green. Very green in fact and pretty grim. Just before we crossed the bridge, two women had become engaged in conversation with a four-year-old boy who exclaimed, and you know, the Lewis is getting a little bit like the tube in London now where everybody's head is down and the whole arc is not to make eye contact or say anything. So when a little boy, for example, speaks at the top of his lungs, it fills the carriage. And he exclaimed, he exclaimed, that's where the green yucky frog monster lives. And one of the women said, that's not where the monster lives. That's pollution. The boy replied, it's not pollution. It's where the green yucky frog lives. Nothing more was said. Then he asked his mother, when do we get off the train? She replied, next stop. These stories speak in particular ways to me. I just love the way the third king has a go, takes a chance and takes the risk. And nativity plays, when they're allowed to breathe like that and don't become too serious, have that huge potential. You've always got to be able to weigh the light and the heavy, and maybe more importantly, weigh the light in an early childhood classroom. And what about the young artist with the spirit of a Renaissance master? I love her confidence and conviction. 
born out of our fantasies of one of the most difficult constructs of all time, what God really looks like. And even if you don't know, and even you did, and if you don't, she knows, and better, she's going to show you. And not forgetting the guy who calls a stinky pond a stinky pond when he sees it. If only more adults would call things with the same belief, authority, things might be a little bit better. He wasn't motivated by a big word like pollution. He hadn't a meaningful or useful frame of reference for it. No, anyone with eyes to see it, a nose to smell it, and ears to hear it, could only come to one conclusion, that there was only one yucky green monster down there. Montessori would certainly approve and remind us of the awesome power of all that sensorial learning happening before we ever construct a material of our own. What these stories collectively spark for me is what I would describe as lessons about the politics of correction and the politics of praise in classrooms. The politics of correction is especially resonant in the last two stories, where the adults feel some kind of compulsion to talk their way into the children's creative and analytical moments in order to correct the technical record. Indeed, it all reminded me of a very thought-provoking article I once read by an American ECCE researcher, Beverly Boz, who wrote that one of the great qualities of an ECCE teacher is not the capacity to talk, but the capacity to interrupt. And it is in our interruptions that we make the most discursive advances. Our theory was that we should measure engagement not by our talk, but by our interruptions. But enough of all this correction stuff and business. The examples more loudly speak on the theme of praise. I'm really, this is one of my hobby horses. We do not hear enough praise in classrooms. If we heard more praise in classrooms, then we would have more of the Renaissance master uh, drawing her picture. We would have more kids taking a risk. We would have kids confounding the neoliberal notion of risk, turning it on its head and having a go in their personal lives. What a massive collateral loss in places where there isn't sufficient praise. One of the traps in all of education is that the politics of correction, like the well-meaning lady on the train, is easier to manage than the politics of praise. I don't mean any kind of casual nod to good, well done, excellent, or even the flavour of the month, amazing, or even shamazing. I mean real high quality praise, praise that is tough on the teacher, tough on the brain, praise that is unique, original, contingent and varied. It's not easy to gather all these cognitive monitorings into a special fleeting moment, but it is really worth it. Think in your own lives and in the tapestry of your own life when that special praise meant so much to you, after you've forgotten all the complicated long division sums where, where Burma is on the map even and all that kind of stuff, you will remember that affirmation riding high above all of those things. Consider again how more meaningful and useful things could have become with some good quality praise in the case of King Number 3, God's Own Sketcher and the Fantasy Environmentalist. On a personal note, I can remember my wife asking our young son on our first day back uh, in Ireland, and he was in an early childhood classroom in this country, how did it go? And his response was that he had a good day, but he didn't think the teacher had a good one. And why was that, his mother inquired. And he replied, well, she couldn't find anything to praise today. With so much being talked about life skills and confidence building for the 21st century, in executive and business contexts, the ECCE classroom is a lab with possibilities unknown. Story number two. I call this the Sleepy Kids. This is my signature story. I use this in all my lectures when I was working um, on the sociology of children and childhood here uh, for seven years. It's a real story. Uh, it's not a makey up one. And I'm going to tell it to you. And I'd like you to really get stuck into it. 
I witnessed what I would describe as an illuminative epiphany on student placement a number of years ago. I would describe this as a spectral story, one that haunts me, one that I can't get out of my head. And there must be stories like that from your repertoire that play back like tapes. In those days, placement took place in early January. There we were, the student, the teacher, and me, looking backwards and forwards through the foggy window, window to door. The bell started, and the bell stopped. Now it's way past nine o'clock. Two kids sat with folded arms. You know the way they go. We hadn't enough children for an observation. It was decision time. The clock was ticking. There was some whispering between two teachers in the hallway. I believe the principal was consulted. The teacher explained to me that no one had explained to the children that Christmas was over. No one had explained to them that it was back to school time and that you have to go whether you like it or not, you know. No one explained it was the day, not the night. A half an hour later, five kids filed into the room and were warmly welcomed back from the holidays. The observation took place. I can't remember the content of that. As I was leaving, the teacher turned on the music system and Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata began to waft gently and softly into the soundscape. The kids put down their heads to go to sleep, but the teacher asked them to wait. She told the kids that she had their Christmas presents, and from the cofra, she took out seven new fluffy pillows and handed them out. And in a moment, all was quiet except for the background music. No counting sheep, in fact, no counting of any kind on that day. There is so much going on in this story. It is hard to know where to begin to make sense of it all. It is important to remember that this is a story where we do not hear the children's voices, yet it means nothing at all without the children. Yet there are sounds in the classroom, the sonic voices in the music system, the ethical voice of the principal slipping out down the hallway, the pedagogical voice of the student teacher, the ventriloquized voice of the teacher, the classed and gender voices of who we are and how we identify ourselves, the spectral voices of the children leaning in against a system that is so far away from them. This is first and foremost a moral story. It tests our ethical sensibilities in all kinds of ways. Does the good outweigh the bad here? Yes, there was education and care unfolded in the story. Is this a testament to the order and sequence of care and education? Were the early program designers of your program inspired and inspiring when they ordered the schema of things to be early childhood care and education? And I would argue they were ingeniously informed when they did that. And not to be slow to recommend that to everybody, that it is that care dimension, sure, linked and integrated with education, but it is the care element that is in your heart and in your minds and that makes you the special teachers that you are. Did the teacher go too far in compromising the curriculum on that day? After all, there was no great learning in that sense. Or did she go far enough? And all those moral issues at the moment that are floating around in the ether with regard to the people running the, um, the soup services for the homeless in Dublin are resident. All of humanity comes into decisions that we make in early childhood care in classrooms. It all suggests that what we understand as the classrooms of young children need to be audited, examined, inspected not only in quantitative terms, but in deeply qualitative ways. And while there is so much talk about curriculum renewal and revision, again, the classroom as a lab needs to be resourced with variables of love, care, and solidarity. And so it would seem that we are not short of stories. 
If anything, we might have an abundance of them, and we don't know what to do with them. The challenge is more one of capturing these elusive stories, which are as delicate as gossamer's wings in the classrooms of multiple agendas, and stake our claim to the importance of this simple and profound idea. To, today, the string that I have been lacing up for the past 30 minutes, I would describe as the six C's of early childhood care and education. Content, communication, collaboration, creative thinking, creative innovation, and confidence. And all of these were sutured into the stories of the children, but made more resonant and believable because they were storied. All of the ties, all of these ties, yes, have been sutured in the stories of the kids. These stories are never ending, dancing to the end of time, to paraphrase the Canadian singer, songwriter, and poet Leonard Cohen, because each generation is called to speak, listen, reflect, and respond. I wish you well as you dance the dance of speaking and listening, and are danced by variables of race, gender, class, community, ability, and belief, and indeed any other variable that will exist and present itself in your classroom next year. I hope you can see your way to recording, interrogating, analysing, and embracing stories as a learning pedagogy in making some kind of sense of it all. I hope, especially, that you get an opportunity to do some travelling in the coming years. A chance to look over the international clothesline and see what the neighbours are up to. And to bring back all kinds of good things from other rooms, other places, other countries. And in time to write your own story of a life as an early years care um, educator. And now that would be really something special. That's all, folks. Thank you for listening. Listening underlined. And good morning. Thank you.
after all. And as you know, with young children, you can't have a celebration without a cake. So um, I'm delighted to call on Dr. Florence Lee to cut the cake and we'd love you to uh, 